did so. Um, and you now I know Ari had a lot, a lot of information, so she did take a little longer than most of you. But uh, we um, keep your presentations to about seven minutes. Um, I I want to go to um, west to Catron County. Um, Catron County has a has seven thousand square miles with a population of approximately thirty five hundred people, with they're sixty percent over the age of fifty, and and the the word is that there's no full full service grocery store in Catron County, but I want to introduce Joanne Young. She has been the Roadrunner Food Distribution Coordinator for Reserve since twenty twenty right when the pandemic was making life extremely difficult. She is the coordinator for the Catron County Health Council and the, with the mission of health, safety, and well-being of, of the county. Hunger is, much, is very much an issue that is near and dear to her. Uh, Joanne, take it away. Thank you. I'm very honored to be a part of this group. Um, as you said, hunger um, is an issue that is near and dear to my heart. Catherine County has, I believe it is five distri food distributions every month. That's Cuamato, Daddle, Luna, Glenwood, and Reserve. And I know Pie Town is trying to get um, a monthly distribution there. Um, I really am not sure what to say. I know that Reserve itself serves about 100 families every month, which is like, Turns out to be 1,200 uh, if you figure a year. And half of those have spouses and are probably raising grandkids. So for a small community, we're doing really well. And we do need to thank Roadrunner because that's where we get our food. We are under their senior hunger initiative. We are also, as a health council, working with Southwest New Mexico Food Alliance, which is down in Silver City. And they're talking about, um, they have a grant where they can put coolers in certain areas of Catherine County. So we're looking forward to that so we can maybe have um, more fresh foods avail available. Because Reserve is not a pantry. We just have a monthly distribution. We're a mobile, we're considered a mobile pantry. So we don't have any place to store food, which let's face it, is kind of not very nice. But we get a lot of great food from Roadrunner and everybody is very appreciative. When we first started up in 2020, we didn't, it was just a few of us um, volunteers that got together and got the program back up and running. And we weren't sure we were how many volunteers we were gonna have. So we were just going to have the people who came through well, it turned out that there were some people that very kindly and good-heartedly volunteered to deliver food boxes to the people who couldn't get out. So every month they deliver about between 20 to 25 food boxes to different people who for some reason don't drive, they live out in the boonies, they can't get in, they're sick, whatever. So we have those every month. And then we have families who come through and pick up for friends who can't make it. So we are very blessed to be such a small community um, and then and we help each other. But our we think our real problem, we don't think we know our real problem is not necessarily our seniors, but it's the people under, you know, from the kids and the people under 50, a lot of them who fall through the cracks. So we just found out recently that the two high schools, Cuamato and Reserve students started a food closet in their school. Now Reserves has free breakfast and free lunches for the kids, but of course that's just Monday through Thursday. So um, they have gotten perishable, non-perishables, non excuse me, and they send it home with the kids so they can have something to eat over the weekend. And that that was something that the health council was not aware of. So we have made um, a contribution of $1,000 to each school with the promise of more to come if they need it. But that's, that's where I think we need to concentrate, at least here in reserve, um, 
is is the younger generation because it just it's not it's not good that our kids are going hungry they they, they need to have proper food um so they can grow and so they can learn um and in that in that stead we have been invited by New Mexico Alliance of Health Councils to participate in an FTT, which is Food to Table, and an EPA food grant. So hopefully we'll be able to do more to help these kids so that they can have good food over the weekend. And I'm sorry I don't have a very long speech, but that's kind of it. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Joanne. That's uh, it, it gives us a little bit of a picture of what's happening in, in Ketron County. Um, I'm just going to go the other direction to other corner of New Mexico um, to Hagerman, uh, just 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 south of, of Roswell. Um, I want to introduce Leanne Sandoval, president of Loaves and Fishes Food Pantry in Hagerman. Loaves and Fishes operates an, an all-volunteer food pantry open to anyone in need living in Dexter, Hagerman, Midway, or Lake Arthur. Chavez County ranks 23rd among New Mexico's 33rd counties for food insecurity. Um, take, it, take it away, Leanne. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, Loves and Fishes has been operating for um, 18 years now, and I was uh, fortunate to get in on the ground floor. So uh, <clears throat> I wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, it was started by some little church ladies. If you've seen Saturday Night Live over the past what, 50 years, you, you'll be familiar with the church lady. And um it remains to be an all-volunteer program. We uh, do not have any paid staff. So uh, we have, um, we serve about, uh, we were serving about 100 families a month. They're, the families are allowed to come once a month for supplemental groceries. And uh, but recently, our numbers have actually dropped. And uh, we attribute that to the fact that uh, Roadrunner Food Bank is doing such a great job uh, reaching out to these smaller communities. Um, the the community where our, our pantry is located actually has a school that it now gives out food that comes from Roadrunner uh, once a week to their families. So I think that has caused our numbers to, to drop down, which is a good thing. Um, and... Um, um, we also have a joy center where uh, seniors are fed um, uh, daily, and they have to buy their meal their meals. But they also get supplemental food here and there uh, from Roadrunner Food Pantry Food Bank. So, so very blessed to have um, a lot of activity from Roadrunner in our area. Um, the thing here, our biggest challenge right now is um, transportation for the people that uh, in the outer reaches of our area. It's a, it's an all agricultural area, lots of ranching, lots of farming, and um, sometimes they just really can't get into to the pantry because they don't have transportation. So that's one of our biggest challenges challenges right now is how to get the food, uh, how to get the food to them. Um, we, um, also have a challenge with, um, with reaching, we, we, we reach a lot of seniors, a lot of disabled people, um, children with our families with a lot of children, uh, but we have uh, trouble reaching out to those outer regions of the of the area to, to bring those people in. So that's that's one of our challenges right now. Uh, I guess we lost Leanne. But thank you. She gave us a lot of good information, so we appreciate her being on on the program. I I want to go down south to Las Cruces, and I want to turn it over to 
Lorenzo Alba, he's executive director of Casa de Peregrinos in Las Cruces and Doña Ana County for, he's done this for 13 years. He's also served on delegate on the delegation of the Farm Bill subcommittees, as well as a statewide food insecurity initiative committees. Take it away, Lorenzo. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I was uh, love when there's this many people involved in the work that we all do uh, in this great fight that we have against food insecurity in our community. So thank you all for being a part of it. First of all, uh, here in Las Cruces, one thing that, uh, uh, and we've done, and I just, you know, hearing the square footage of, uh, the square mileage of uh, uh, Katrin County right now, which is mind boggling, right? Uh, how do we take care of a, a, a county the size of that, even with a low population? How do you reach everybody? It's a difficult thing that we do in New Mexico uh, in a very rural state. So we've taken a different approach here. We uh, feel very strongly about it, adding infrastructure. And that is what we are doing. We added a, a food pantry in the Hatch area. And in the last week, we've broken ground on two pantries in the southern part of the county. One in Chaparral, which is already fully funded. And by this time next year, we should be having a ribbon cutting. Um, and then one in uh, Sunland Park. And that one is still a little bit off. We're still about a million dollars off from getting it complete funded, completely funded. But um, we should have that ready to go fully funded after this legislative session uh, and really moving quickly. So um, it's super exciting that we're able to add the infrastructure. And just so you know how we got there, um, this has been part of Casa Pedrino strategies for the last 40 years. They've always saw it that we should go into the rural communities. What we're doing now is we're taking a different approach to it than just the mobile food pantry. We, we still have uh, 10 of those going on uh, within our county. But with that being said, uh, the differences are huge. And I'll just give you a quick example. We opened up the one in Hatch. We closed down three mobile food pantries in the northern part of the county. Through those, through those three mobile food pantries, we were averaging about 175, 180 distributions every month through those mobile food pantries. Now we are distributing 450 distributions a month in one pantry. The amount of people that are registered uh, to receive services is over a thousand families that have registered for services in the northern part of Doñana County through that pantry and hatch. We're not even complete with renovations and this is already happening. We haven't even added all the services that we are currently using in Las Cruces. Uh, and I can see those numbers increasing to well over 500 to 550 distributions a month, which we thought would happen. We just didn't think it was gonna happen that fast, to be honest with you. We thought it was gonna take some time for it to take off but people are at a great comfort level uh, coming to a, their own food pantry here uh, in Hatch. So it's exciting. Uh, we, again, we feel that that's gonna happen in Chaparral and that's what's gonna happen in, in Sunland Park, which is basically the poorest part of most of New Mexico at 41% poverty levels there. You know, We are going to them. We're gonna change the way we close uh, that hunger gap and we're gonna do it through infrastructure and we're gonna we're gonna try to get government agencies to fund these facilities and allow us to run them, allow us to operate them and to make a big impact in this. The best part about it is a collaboration between a municipality, the county, the state of New Mexico. Uh, it's huge. Even the school district in Hatch is involved in that pantry, which is super fantastic. That's the way to go about this, in our opinion. We're hoping that we can set up a model so that other people will look at what we are doing to really close the hunger gap and especially some high poverty rural communities. Um, we had a great year. And I think because we opened a new facility in Las Cruces last year for the fiscal year, we were able to offer more services to this community, uh, which is really incredible. 
because of that, our numbers year over year are about 24% up. I think it's not just the demand and the need, but also that we're giving food out different ways. We added a state-of-the-art drive-up pantry to this 13,000 square foot facility. We also have a delivery service that's delivering food out into the community, not just through us, but through community partners. The police department is helping us, a fire department, emergency service, adult protective service, uh, CYFD. Uh, these organizations are a huge part of what we do. Uh, one thing we know at Casa Peregrinos is that we can't do this work alone, that we can only do it through collaboration. As Ari was alluding to earlier, without our partners, we can't get that much food out into the community. We need them. And uh, you, it doesn't matter uh, who they are and what they're doing, what part of role they play. It's important that you make the entire community part of this fight against food insecurity. It's super important to also be very vocal about it. And we tend to do that very well here, uh, getting in front of people as much as we can and talking about the work that we're doing and the work that we're collaborating with other partners in the community. Um, unbelievably, uh, we have been looked at by other organizations to try to, try to uh, show them what we're doing. They've come from different places. I've had visitors from Tyler, Texas. I've had visitors from other parts of the world come take a look at our model and what we're doing. They are fascinated with the idea that we're actually building facilities to do these services. Um, so they come and take a look. The big project uh, that we're working on right now is also to add some community kitchens as part of a revenue driver for our 501c3. We're gonna put those right behind our current building in Las Cruces, along with a brand new state-of-the-art soup kitchen that we will be building uh, with our partners at El Caldito Soup Kitchen. This again is a collaboration with the state, the federal government and the city of Las Cruces. And this is the only way that we feel very strong these things work. I, I think as a ulterior motive for it, we feel like uh, this community should be preparing meals for the hungry in our communities through education. So why not have the culinary programs at Las Cruces Public Schools, at the community college, at New Mexico State University, come prepare meals that we could freeze and hand out to the homeless, hand out to um, our seniors, very specific meals, healthy meals for them, um, and also for you know those folks that are diabetic or have other health issues. Why not have the community prepare those meals out of these kitchens that we're gonna build? Yes, yeah, a lot of ulterior motive there because I think it just fits into our model of what we're doing and making this a community effort, not just a Casa de Peregrinos effort. With that being said, I think that nothing that we do is possible without our partner, uh, Roadrunner Food Bank. I mean, what we do with them is pretty unbelievable, unprecedented. Last year, we distributed 4.3 million meals, well over 5 million pounds of food. Uh, I can tell you that about 50, 60% of that food, produce, fresh produce, fresh produce. The average size of a basket at Casa de Peregrinos is 110 pounds of food in every basket. We feel like we're making a dent on this by doing those things because we, it, gives our, it gives the families that we serve an option. Let's go to Casa Peregrinos first and let's figure out how we can spend some of these SNAP dollars. Let's figure out what other bills we can get ahead of ourselves, but let's go to Casa de Peregrinos first and let's find out what we receive from them. It gives them options on what to do and how they spend their hard-earned money. This is a way that we feel it is gonna make a real impact in addressing some of the generational poverty issues in our community. This is something that I'm very proud of uh, for our organization is the fact that we've taken the time to get to know our partners and what how they can fit into what we do. Uh, I can't say enough again about the food bank because they sat down with us and we told them this is what we need. And they've been very, very gracious and to share uh, their knowledge, not only with their personnel, but also as well as their resources to get us to the next step. That's gonna continue and we're gonna to begin to do that with some of the smaller pantries here. 
We've already began to share food with some of the smaller pantries in Las Cruces. And we'll continue to do those partnerships because in a county as big as Doñana County, there's absolutely no way that we could address it all without each other. But we're going to continue to do that. I would be remiss by not including Doñana County on this because they are one of our largest funders. Uh, they basically forked out half a million dollars so that we could go ahead and start construction on Chaparral. Um, again, we're taking uh, this uh, to a different level by adding infrastructure. Hopefully one day we'll be able to add some cold storage somewhere close to here that we will be able to share not only with small farmers in our area, but also to use to receive some food, especially while Roadrunner is doing this great work in Mexico and bringing some of this great produce across the border. It's uh, interesting that it's World Food Day today, and this is a conversation that we're having together, is because we need to really take note of where the food really comes from. It comes from all over the place. We grow a lot of food here in New Mexico, but 99% of it gets exported out. So we need to get it from somewhere else sometimes, right? Let's convince our legislators and our government to give some incentives so some of that food can stay here in New Mexico. Let's convince our leaders to have these serious conversations so that New Mexico food can stay here. We have partnerships that are beginning to work now, especially with uh, uh, the Farm to Food Bank. What a great program. We're a big part of that as well, like Aria's. And wow, that program is phenomenal because now we get food that's coming actually just from across the county, uh, which is amazing, which is amazing. And we can share that with our clients. And did you know that this came from this farm? Oh, wow, we didn't know they were here. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So with that being said, I'll pass it on. The numbers are growing a little bit, but the fact that we're able to continue these services and added services that we've added to uh, you know, our toolbox, if you will, is what's gonna really help us here. Continue to have these conversations. I can just advise you of that. Continue to have these conversations on a local level. Get everybody involved. Don't try to do this alone. Don't try to do it by yourself. I'm telling you right now, the more people that are involved in your mission, the better things are gonna go for you. Please continue to work hard, continue to do it with compassion and passion, and just a big love for New Mexicans, a big love for New Mexicans. So with that, I'll let you go. And um, thank you, Mr. Navarro, for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, um, I'm very inspired by you. And if you see the little sign behind me, uh, Mr. Navarro, it's uh, from our annual hunger strike. They got, we do an annual hunger strike, which raises money for us, uh, where we actually do a 24-hour fast uh, in, in basically in solidarity with our friends that are going through food insecurity. And uh, I was inspired by Mr. Navarro's story that he told me a long, long time ago, and I never forgot about it. Never forgot about it. And I ran into him last year, and I told him, I said, we did it. This is our sixth year that we're going to do this. And um, in the six years that we've been doing this, it probably raised uh, about six or seven hundred thousand dollars. So uh, very proud of the initiative, even if we didn't raise a dime. Just the fact that we actually were there with our clients for 24 hours is amazing. It's amazing. It, we feel a part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think the story that he's referring to is I, one time I mentioned that former representative, um, um, uh, uh, the chair of the Hunger Caucus, um, Tony Hall. And he's also, he was actually the, at one time also the U US ambassador to the Food and Agriculture Organization. But when he was in Congress, he did uh, fast to bring attention to hunger and the lack of commitment by the U.S. Congress to address hunger. And so that's the story that Lorenzo was referring to that I mentioned. Okay, last but not least, we're going north to, to Taos. And we have, I think, at least two guests. I, I want to introduce um, Cami Hartman, Student Resources Navigator um, at UNM Taos. And she's uh, she says the ultimate goal to of uh, 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 her ultimate goal of her is to create a hunger-free campus where no one goes without food. 
and the aim is to provide a stigma-free approach to feeding students, faculty, and staff. And Reverend Sherry Lyon is the director of Shared Table Food Pantry and Taos and pastor of El Pueblito United Methodist Church. So I'll I'll pass it on to Cami and, and Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Hi, everyone. So glad to be a part of this group. I'm getting so inspired, I can tell you. Um, so, um, Sherry, do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Oops, you're on mute. Sherry, Sherry you're on mute still. There Sorry about that. It's been a while since I've done as much Zoom. Um, Cami, thanks. I'll go just a moment or two about the overall program and then turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. So welcome everyone to Northern New Mexico. Um, and the sh we have several t uh, food pantries in Taos County, but today we're talking about um, the shared table, which serves about 500 households twice a month and then has um, a home delivery program once a month and uh, runs a diaper program for the county. So Carrie's gonna talk about what, uh, the university initiative and what's going on with uh, university students here in Taos. We also support, and we are very, very thankful for uh, the Food Depot in Santa Fe. But a brief piece that I wanted to share is Often one of the challenges for some communities is being able to have year round drivers for, we do about 60 uh, food boxes for home deliveries. And so we are blessed with the local uh, electric utility company, Kit Carson Electric actually helped us start uh, by funding the home delivery program and provides uh, drivers. And the great news about that is those utility trucks can go anywhere, anytime. And it's really connected us uh, as with an additional partner that was unlikely. So utility companies may be a source of support. They have a lot of heart for the community and they've made things possible. As all of you probably know, um, an additional piece of that is that Taos has a ski resort about 30 miles away from us. And one of the things that's happened over the past several years since uh, the pandemic is we've been able to do hot Thanksgiving dinners that are cooked and packaged um, by the food service chef at uh, the Taos Ski Valley. And they bring them to us. And then we use that same team of volunteers. So just looking at different partners that have been able to do work uh, with us. But again, a huge shout out to the Food Depot for all their support. They are our partner in Central and Northern New Mexico. And now I want to turn it over to Cami to talk about a really exciting initiative at UNM Taos. Thanks again, Sherry. You're awesome. Um, really what that means is that um, my role is to connect students who are facing barriers to their education, um, connect them with resources. And as you can imagine, there's all kinds of needs, right? Um, mental health, food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation, um, finances, big time. Um, and uh, the cost of living in our community in Taos has gotten out of control. We definitely have a housing crisis. And so we started to really pay attention to some of our statistics. And in 2021, we learned that over a third of our students, so one out of three students was experiencing food insecurity. And at the time, we didn't have any food services on campus. All we have are some vending machines. And um, so got a little support from our student government at the time to open a small cupboard outside under a portal um, that had some canned goods. And it 
was successful. So we really learned that we um, could do more and got even further support this last year to open what we now have as a, I would call it like a little mini grocery store. Um, and we got that support from a local foundation, Lore Foundation, and our and our current student government. And they were able to buy, um, you know, three door glass refrigerators and a nice freezer. And um, because of that, we can now have fresh produce and wonderful things. And the wonderful things we've been getting are coming from El Pueblito Methodist Church, the shared table. Um, who's been really generous with their support, giving us um, also those box meals, um, not the prepared ones, but the um, perish non-perishable, and then also the diaper program, because we have a lot of our students who um, are parents, and as we know, diapers are wicked expensive. <laughs> um, so that partnership has just been flourishing. That same group Sherry mentioned has been delivering um, up to 25 um, prepared little boxes of things for our students, uh, you know, every month. So that's been a real godsend. And then the other thing is our partnership with St. James Episcopal Church. Um, at the end of their food distribution day, we um, are benefiting from all kinds of extra goodies that they didn't quite give away that day. And they tend to give us a lot. So we're stocking our freezer and refrigerator with help from them and a little bit of support from our university who said, hey, why don't you take 50 cents of every credit hour and apply it to a food budget? So I thought it was going to be a lot more. I'm a little shocked right now, but <laughs> it's about uh, it's about 3,500 to 4,000 uh, a semester. So that's something we can work with. And we we just try to supplement it with um, nutritional stuff that we're not also getting from St. James and um, El Pueblito. So I don't know, it's pretty exciting. We've got a really cool space and we've got a lot of students who are stopping by. Our, our program is called Thrive Food and Resource Center. And so it's pretty awesome. Thank you for sharing the article, Katie. Um, um, but it's awesome because students can come in and they're here for a snack or from some food, but they also get to get support applying for SNAP benefits or um, help looking for housing or help getting emergency funding. So it's been a really cool process and I actually hope to grow it just as much as all the wonderful um, guests have been on this panel today. Um, you know, to the moon and back, but we just barely opened this, this August. So it's, uh, we're still, we're still expanding. Thank you. Thank you, Cami and Sherry. It's, it was a great presentation. I, I think what this panel shows us that um, we in New Mexico, we're all working together to try and, and find ways to address, reduce hunger in our community. And, and so this is great and we hope we, we continue moving in that direction. As I mentioned in the in the chat, if anyone has any questions for our panelists, please write them in the chat and we'll try and and have those questions answered in writing sometime somehow. But we this is this concludes our program and I will turn it back to Katie. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you to all of our incredible speakers. I, uh, my heart is full <laughs> hearing about all this incredible work. You know, I think sometimes when we have these conversations, it can it can be really challenging.